tonight on First at 9, this Thursday, the 22nd of August 2024. Law of the land. The president violated the fundamental rights of the people by postponing local government elections, rules the Supreme Court. Ray of hope. Sri Lanka set to increase public sector salaries across the board. Constructive goals. President Ranil Vikramasinghe emphasizes the growth potential of the construction sector and aims to boost construction through increased foreign investments. Cabinet decisions. The Cabinet of Ministers approves a concessionary price for chemical fertilizers to enhance tea production. Financial subsidies for paddy and other cultivations. Obey Vishwasi Dino Sinsurain, then Nagamati Pharmacy in Labata the Hacker. This is Ada Verna First at Nine, live from Studio 24 in Colombo. Good evening and welcome to tonight's edition of Other There and a First at Nine. I'm Tarindu Mahendra, joining you live with the latest in Sri Lanka and from around the world. President Ranil Vikramasinghe says that the construction sector of the country possesses an immense potential to grow with the influx of foreign investments to Sri Lanka in the near future. Addressing an event in Colombo, the president said the government is focusing on a series of projects such as construction of hotels, economic zones and the rebuilding of major cities. A meeting of the professionals of the construction sector was held in Colombo yesterday under the patronage of President Ranil Vikramasinghe. We had a fairly large construction sector, all depending on foreign funded projects and a few large investments. And then it all closed down. So what have we done? We've kept the banks to ensure that they don't really go and close in on you. And secondly, we've used the opportunity to ensure that backlog of payments have been cleared. A lot of it has been cleared, there are some more to be cleared. But I think unlike earlier times, we thought we'll look at how we can reduce the burden on you. And next comes, what do you do as we open out? There are a lot of scope for us. Look at our development. Once we get the aid back, as the disbursements come in, we revive the existing projects. A large number of them are construction projects. We revive all those projects. Secondly, as foreign investment comes and local investment comes in, there will be more construction. We are looking at about a fair amount of land in Gaul for high-rise hotel buildings. Similarly, we are looking at construction of hotels in Kandy, more in Colombo and later on in Trincomalee. So the construction, the tourism sector itself, the new zones that we are keep putting up at Bingiria to begin with in Jaffna, we hope to do in Hambantota. So there are a large number of projects where there is a component of construction involved. But unlike last time, a fair amount of it will also come from the private sector. Outside that is to rebuild the cities, whole of Colombo and the megapolis plan, which is there, the development of Gaul, of Kandy. We'll be rebuilding the cities. That's another opportunity. There are a lot of land here underutilized, belong to the government. We'll open it out for people to build on. It's for you to find the invest and come in. The land we will find, the rest you find, and we make it possible. But there are also your concerns, which I think we have to address. Some of you are wondering what will happen to my job in the state sector. I don't think anyone has to worry about their jobs, whether they are in the state sector or the private sector. There will be enough work for all of you. And certainly your concerns of pay is being addressed. These are some issues that concern you all. But we must also look at how this ties up with the country's economy and your sector. Horizon Campus 2024 Intake 2. Register now. Crunchy goodness for hunger on the go. The Supreme Court ruled that the President, in his capacity as the Minister of Finance and the members of the then Election Commission, have violated the fundamental rights of the country's voters through the postponement of the 2023 local government elections. Further, the Apex Court ordered the Election Commission to take steps to conduct the postponed election as soon as possible. The Election Commission originally scheduled the 2023 local government elections for the 9th of March 2023. However, with the Ministry of Finance and other relevant institutions declaring that it was difficult to allocate sufficient funds for the election in view of the financial regulations enacted due to the prevailing economic crisis, the polls were postponed until the 25th of April. However, the polls were not held on the 25th of April either and were postponed indefinitely. Subsequently, the Samagjana Balavegia, the National 
National People's Power, the Center for Policy Alternatives and the People's Action for Free and Fair Elections filed fundamental rights petitions before the Supreme Court, requesting that the Apex Court issue a ruling that the fundamental rights of the country's voters were violated through the postponement of the elections. Following the consideration of the relevant petitions, the five-member Supreme Court judge bench comprising Chief Justice Jayanta Jayasuriya and Justices Vijit Malal Goda, Mud Fernando, Garmini Amrasekare and Yasanta Kodagode delivered its verdict today. Delivering the court's verdict, Justice Garmini Amrasekar highlighted that the elections not being conducted within the proper time frame was a violation not only of the sovereignty of the people but also of universal franchise. He further stated that it is the responsibility of the Election Commission to ensure that the election is held within the proper time frame and added that by failing to do so, the members of the then Election Commission had violated Article 14 1A of the Constitution. Justice Amr Sekhar then went on to highlight that the President had contributed to the polls being postponed. He noted that the President, in his capacity as the Minister of Finance, had not taken steps to obtain approval to allocate the funds necessary for the election. He added that against the backdrop where the Cabinet decision to only prioritise essential state expenses was not passed in Parliament, refusing to allocate funds for the election was a violation of the law. Accordingly, the Supreme Court ruled that the President, in his capacity as the Minister of Finance and the members of the then Election Commission had violated the fundamental rights of the country's voters by failing to hold the local government polls on the 9th of March 2023. Further, the court ordered the Election Commission to conduct the postponed election as soon as possible. We were exploring ways to conduct the election within the existing legal framework. The Commission has been strengthened by today's verdict. This verdict indicates that the Commission must take necessary action, regardless of the circumstances, without shirking its responsibilities. The President knew that given the SJB's position at that time, he would likely lose if the elections were held. To prevent this, he withheld funds to sabotage the election. However, all those actions were overturned by the Supreme Court today. There were 32 attempts to postpone this election. While this verdict directly pertains to the local government election, it will have implications for future elections as well. Crunchy goodness for hunger on the go. Opposition leader Sajid Premadasa assures that those who violated the public right to an election will be further held accountable for their actions following his election to office in the near future. Addressing a rally in Moratua, Premadasa said that they are never ready to stand with a leader who violates fundamental rights, auction state assets and deteriorates the lives of the people. Another election rally of the presidential candidate of the Samagijana Sandane, opposition leader Sajid Premadasa, was held in Moritua this afternoon. The Supreme Court determined that the process that was carried out to postpone the local government elections led to a violation of the fundamental rights of the people. The Supreme Court stated that the President is responsible for the recklessness and illegal behavior displayed in this regard. The President was found guilty of violating the supreme law of the land, which is the Constitution. Isn't the decision that we took correct? How can we stand with a leader who violates fundamental rights, auctions state assets and deteriorates the lives of our people? The President is contesting the election as a leader who has violated the fundamental rights of the land. I will assure you that those who violated the public right to an election will be further held accountable for their actions in the future. Meanwhile, the government has approved an increase in the basic salary of public service employees by a minimum of 24% for the lowest grades and by 24 to more than 50% for all public service professionals, effective from January next year. Additionally, considering prevailing inflation rates and other economic factors, the Presidential Expert Committee on Wage Discrepancies has proposed maintaining the cost of living allowance unchanged for three years, starting from January. 2025. 
During a press briefing at the Presidential Media Centre today, Chairman of the Presidential Expert Committee on Wage Discrepancies, Uday R. Seneviratna, stated that the Cabinet and Treasury have approved the salary increase. He added that following this amendment, the basic salary for the lowest paid employees in the public service will be 30,000 rupees, with a total salary of 55,000 rupees, including the cost of living allowance. He also noted that from January 2025, a cost of living allowance of 12,500 rupees will be provided to pensioners. Furthermore, government employees who retired before 2020 will receive the unpaid increment and their pensions will be revised accordingly. Seneviratna assured that the 2025 budget will include measures to deliver these benefits in a phased manner based on the existing fiscal capacity. Additionally, Seneviratna announced that a scientific study will be conducted on the public service in 2025 with the goal of increasing efficiency. Measures will also be taken to adjust the number of employees in the public service according to requirements. Leader and presidential candidate of the National People's Power, Anura Kumara Disanayake, claims that the government's decision to implement a 2,500 rupee increase in government employee salaries starting in January is impossible to achieve. He made this remark at an NPP rally in Bandaragama today. A rally of the National People's Power's presidential campaign was held this evening in Bandaragama under the patronage of the party's leader and presidential candidate Anura Kumara Disanayake. Yesterday, former parliamentarian Talata Atukorula confirmed that Sajid Premadasa is an immature leader. Only those close to him truly understand his character. Shambhika Ranamako also mentioned that Sajid is immature. He believes that speaking fluent English is all it takes to be a leader. Although Shambhika has no columns about rejoining Sajid, his criticism still holds merit. Mangala Samaravira left first, followed by Fonseca. Shambhika left but rejoined. Now Talata has also departed. More departures are likely as people realize they cannot advance with him. In the past, we thought he could achieve something, but now he cannot hide his shortcomings. Ultimately, just like Namal, Sajid too will only be left with a few followers. Ranil Vikramasinghe has stated that he plans to develop the country by 2048 and requests that we be patient until that time. By 2048, Ranil will be 99 years old. These plans appear to be quite strategic. He did not say that he will develop the country by 2030, perhaps to avoid media scrutiny on whether the development has actually occurred. By that time, there may be no one left to question about the progress. We plan to advance the country in stages. Currently, we have introduced a scheme to provide 10,000 rupees in allowances to those lacking basic needs. But this support is temporary until development occurs and people receive proper remuneration. We cannot simply tell the people to endure hunger while we work on development. Recently, Ranil announced a subsidy of 15,000 rupees per hectare and plans to increase government employees' salaries by 25,000 rupees from January. Currently, there are 1.4 million state employees. If salary are increased by 25,000 rupees each, the total monthly expenditure would rise to 3.5 billion rupees, requiring an additional 400 billion rupees annually. These statements seem unrealistic and impossible to be implemented by January. So why is he waiting until January? Because he knows that he will have lost power by that time. Sarva Janabale presidential candidate Dilit Jayavir asserts that the government's approach to state-owned enterprise restructuring is fundamentally flawed. He made these remarks during a meeting with, a, with the representatives of the Telecommunication Engineers Union. Representatives of the Telecommunication Engineers Union yesterday met with Sarva Janabale presidential candidate Dilit Jayavira. During the meeting, the engineers requested that Jayavira intervene to prevent the sale of Sri Lanka Telecom during the election period. <laughs> Telecom, <laughs> <laughs> 
Meanwhile, representatives of the National Union of Sri Lanka Telecom staged a silent protest in front of the Election Commission this morning, opposing the sale of state-owned shares of Sri Lanka Telecom during the presidential election. Afterwards, they handed over a letter to the Election Commission. Now let's take a look at some cabinet decisions made during the week. During the meeting of the Cabinet of Ministers, approval was granted to implement a pilot project to establish artificial intelligence-related student societies in 100 schools island-wide involving students from grades 6 to 9. This initiative aims to provide students with opportunities to engage in studies related to artificial intelligence, educate them on global trends and contribute effectively to economic development. In another decision, approval was given to provide a 50 kilogram bundle of chemical fertilizer at a concessionary price of 4,000 rupees for tea growers through the State Fertilizer Company Limited. This measure seeks to increase tea production, which has declined due to the recent ban on chemical fertilizer. Additionally, approval was granted to sell fertilizer at a competitive price after importing it for the 2024 25 Maha season. A financial subsidy of 15,000 rupees per hectare for up to two hectares will also be provided for paddy and other cultivations. Another decision involves the contract for purchasing three shipments of Murban-type crude oil from Vital Asia Private Limited in Singapore. The purchase will be made for the period from the 15th of November 2024 to the 14th of April 2025 with payment terms of 30 days through a letter of credit issued by the Bank of Ceylon. Following observations on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and the economic crisis on the fisheries industry, it has been decided to provide immediate relief by granting an allowance for fuel used in the industry. Accordingly, the Cabinet has approved an allowance of 25 rupees per litre of diesel for fisheries vessels that use diesel as fuel for a period of six months. Additionally, an allowance of 25 rupees per litre of kerosene will be provided for up to 25 days per month with a maximum of 15 litres per day for for fishermen using kerosene as fuel. During the media briefing today, Cabinet spokesperson Dr. Bandula Gudavardhana also commented on the proposed relief measures for personal income tax. No changes can be made to taxes this year. The President, during a discussion on educational transformation, stated that discussions are ongoing regarding relief for personal income tax and payee tax. Proposals from both the state and the IMF are under consideration and any changes are expected to take effect in 2025. Start dishwasher Delhi till Indul Pass Wednesday. Start dishwasher Magic Topica. Welcome back. Now, a UN Human Rights Office report issued today has identified renewed threats to fundamental freedoms in Sri Lanka, evidenced by new or proposed regressive laws and erosion of democratic checks and balances. UN Human Rights Chief Volker Turk said as the country approaches presidential and parliamentary elections, it has an opportunity to recommit to the transformational changes demanded by a broad cross-section of Sri Lankans, including accountability and reconciliation. The report points to several laws and bills introduced by the government since 2023, giving security forces broad powers and significantly expanding pre-existing restrictions on freedoms of expression, opinion and association. Turk added that this trend is particularly concerning as the country is in an important pre-election period. The report also highlighted that the impunity and lack of accountability 
persists for crimes committed during and after the civil war that ended in 2009. The UN High Commissioner of Human Rights noted that the government elected next month should recommit to address the root causes of conflict and undertake fundamental, constitutional and institutional reforms to address the accountability gap and work towards reconciliation. Meanwhile, the newly appointed Lithuanian ambassador to Sri Lanka, Diana Mitskovicini, stated that the Lithuania, as a leader in global tech sector, is prepared to offer expert support and technical assistance in Sri Lanka for its economic and technological sectors following discussions with the Sri Lankan government. The statement came after she presented her credentials to President Ranil Vikramasinghe in Colombo yesterday. President Ranil Vikram Singh received the credentials of two newly appointed High Commissioners and three Ambassadors in Colombo yesterday. The diplomats who presented their credentials were Dienna Mitskovicini, Ambassador-designate of the Republic of Lithuania based in New Delhi, Trin Thi Tam, Ambassador-designate of the Socialist Republic of Vietnam based in Colombo, Mala Den Thak, Ambassador-designate of the Republic of the Union of Myanmar based in Colombo, Percy Patson Chanda, High Commissioner-designate of the Republic of Zambia based in New Delhi, Delhi, and Andalip Elias, High Commissioner-designate of the People's Republic of Bangladesh, based in Colombo. Following the presentation of credentials, President Vikramasinghe engaged in a cordial conversation with the newly appointed ambassadors and high commissioners. In the meantime, Lithuanian Ambassador Diana Mitskovicini commented on key sectors for potential collaboration between Sri Lanka and Lithuania. We are celebrating 28 years of diplomatic relationship between Sri Lanka and Lithuania. How do you weave the current state of relations between our two countries and what are the areas that you see that we have key opportunities for further cooperation? Several areas that I would mention would be an important. First would be a political dialogue with your government to make sure we understand each other better. We know we support each other where we can. Small countries have better understanding of each other so we have to build on this. We also share colonial foreign rule experience and we're fiercely sovereign and independent and want to keep it this much needs to be done in economic areas so this would be the absolute priority for me because it's not just increasing the figures in trade or services but in actually getting our companies and institutions work together Lithuania is a very digitalized country one of the top countries in terms of e-government ICT solutions by and large laser cyber security where we are one of the leading nations in the world fintech is another area we have to renew our dialogue on what best we can offer to Sri Lanka that comes from Lithuania we have companies who already work here and they work in fact involving a lot of local talent they develop solutions in robotics in biometrics for example in telematics try to build from that and see where else we can do I would love to bring the team of experts in, in areas that your government and your sectors identify as you know something you need so that they can jointly work and develop solutions for everyone else and third but not least important is of course cultural and educational exchanges this is also something that has already been happening it's almost three decades of our exchanges so we will build on that In your business news, the Colombo Bourse closed in red today as a result of price losses in counters such as Sampath Bank, Ceylon Tobacco Company and Commercial Bank with turnover crossing 797 million rupees. The benchmark all share index closed 0.21% lower at 11,458.05 points while the S&P Sri Lanka 20 fell by 0.43% to close at 3,288.49 points. Crossings were witnessed in Commercial Bank, Dialogue Asciata and Kalani Tires, accounting for 42.1% of the turnover. The banking sector was the top contributor to the market turnover, while the telecommunication services sector came in second. Trading volume on the index, meanwhile, rose to 42.6 million shares from 24.6 million in the previous session. Mixed interest was observed in Hatton National Bank, John Keels Holdings and Associated Motor Finance Company, while retail interest was noted in Tess Agro, Nation Lanka Finance and Cooperative Insurance Company. 
Foreign investors were net buyers purchasing shares worth 37.3 million rupees, while domestic investors closed as net sellers offloading shares worth 776 million rupees. And with that, let's take a look at the rupee exchange rate for the day. And with that, we wrap up tonight's edition of First at Nine. Thank you for joining us and have a good night.